Good morning, and welcome to the Collaborative on Health and the Environment Alaska teleconference on mercury pollution in Alaska. My name is Diana DeFazio, and on behalf of Alaska Community Action on Toxics, I'll be facilitating this morning's call. Che Alaska is a regional partnership group of the National Collaborative on Health and the Environment. Che Alaska aims to advance knowledge and effective action to address growing concerns about the links between human health and environmental factors. And you can find more information on the following websites, www.healthandenvironment.org and www.akaction.org. While there are a number of ways that people can be exposed to mercury, coal-fired power plants are the largest single source of mercury emissions in the United States. Mercury is naturally present in coal and is released, released when coal is burned. The primary source of mercury contamination in Alaska is emissions from power plants in Asia. New coal mines are now being proposed for development in Alaska, and if these mines are developed, the increased export of coal to Asia will increase mercury pollution here at home. Existing local sources of mercury contamination from improper disposal of coal combustion waste is also an environmental health concern for Alaskans. ACAP's new report, available on our website, at www.akaction.org, discusses what we found when we sampled coal combustion waste in the Fairbanks area last summer. In some samples, mercury was found at levels 70 times higher than background soils. We are so pleased to be joined today by three environmental health experts. Dr. Kendra Zamzo will discuss sources of mercury exposure in Alaska and how mercury accumulates in fish, wildlife, and people. Dr. Alan Lockwood will review what is known about the adverse health effects of exposure to mercury. And Sarah Petras will talk about state and international actions to minimize and eliminate mercury pollution. And after the presentations, we will open the lines for questions and discussion. Before I introduce our first speaker, I'd like to remind you that background information and additional resources for this call can be found on our website. Go to www.akaction.org and click on the title of this call in the top left-hand column of our homepage. There are a number of resources listed there, some of which our speakers will be referencing during their presentations. And the call will last one hour, except for the speakers, all participants are muted during the presentation. Now I'd like to welcome and introduce our first presenter, Dr. K Dr. Kendra Zamzo. Dr. Zamzo is an environmental biogeochemist and is the Alaska representative for the Center for Science and Public Participation. She specializes in microbial interactions with trace metals, environmental toxicology, and processes related to acid rock drainage and metal leaching, particularly with regards to water quality. She has a PhD in environmental sciences and health from the University of Nevada, Reno, and a bachelor's degree in molecular and cellular biology from Humboldt State University, California. Since joining the Center for Science and Public Participation, Kendra has provided technical assistance to NGOs and tribes, provided testimony to Alaska state legislative bodies, and provided expert witness testimony before the state of Alaska. Kendra has lived and worked in Alaska for two decades. Kendra, would you like to begin? Yeah. Um, make sure that uh, if anyone can't hear me, please let me know, because I, I know I'm trying a different method than I normally do. Um, so I guess what I'm going to try to do in the, the short period of time here is to talk very briefly about um, atmospheric transport uh, sources, uh, how mercury arrives in Alaska both locally and globally, um, and once it arrives in Alaska, how that becomes a risk or what factors are involved in that because simply arriving here does not always make it a risk. Um, so a lot of this information is available in uh, two of the documents that I've posted. Um, one is called Mercury on the Move, Mercury Cycling in Alaska, and that really talks about uh, forms of mercury in transport. And then um, Coal and Mercury in Alaska talks more about the uh, uh, fish and wildlife and human effects and that sort of thing. So just to let you know where to find those references. Um, so first off, I guess, I, I, a real brief overview on what kinds, how you find mercury. Um, I, I hope most people are familiar with the, uh, the thermometer type mercury. If you break the thermometer, you get these little beads of, of uh, solid mercury that roll around and are great fun to play with. Um, that's what we call elemental mercury. Uh, if that kind of mercury is heated, it becomes a gas and enters the air. And, and there's a large difference in 
how long that mercury can last, depending on whether it's in the gas form or in other forms. There are other forms. Uh, there's the non-elemental type of mercury that we call um, reactive gaseous mercury or ionic mercury is available to be bound to other things. And that's, that's important to know because that's um, the type of mercury that comes out of the air and enters um, the land or water, either by attaching to dust or by dissolving in uh, fog and rain and snow and that sort of thing. So that, that kind of mercury is important. Um, and then there's what we call particulate mercury, which can travel around on particles. And then there's methyl mercury, which we'll talk about in a little, a little bit. So there's the, the, the form of mercury is pretty important as far as um, where mercury is going and how long it's going to stay around. Um, the sources I wanted to talk about in two different ways. There's natural sources and human sources. And there's also local and global sources. So an example of some natural sources would be things like volcanoes, uh, oceans, actually off-gas some mercury. Um, the forest floor can have uh, mercury in it. Trees have mercury in them. So these are all kind of natural sources that have been around forever. Humans tend to then uh, concentrate mercury um, by burning it in coal plants or by different industrial processing uh, means. So I wanted to give uh, some examples of each of these types. So one of the largest natural sources we have locally in Alaska is forest fires. And that's estimated to release about 29 tons of mercury a year. Um, and that kind of mercury mostly will go up in the air and can then be transported around the northern hemisphere. Um, volcanoes also in Alaska. We actually have no idea how much mercury is released from volcanoes. Uh, so they found it's a little difficult to actually fly through an erupting volcano and measure the mercury, although they've tried. Um, local human uh, releases of mercury would be from things like incinerators. Uh, if there are mercury sources um, that are being burned, and of course, old mercury mines, where they actually were mining for the mercury itself. And that can be um, quite a source, although it tends to be more of the particulate kind of mercury. And there doesn't seem to be a lot of um, methyl mercury, although I'll um, give you some numbers on the, the fish methyl mercury in those areas a little later. Um, globally, of course, coal is one of the biggest sources. And uh, I, I want to mention some numbers for both coal and mining, because they are, I think, two of the biggest sources. Um, about 48 tons per year is released from the US alone from coal combustion. About 12 tons a year, so about a quarter of that number, is released uh, from US gold mining. So it's not insignificant. And I'm mentioning that because that is an up-and-coming source here in Alaska that I think we need to, we need to consider. Um, of course, there is coal exploration in Alaska. Uh, Chuitna mine is very close to being permitted. Uh, Wishbone Hill near Palmer and potentially some uh, in the Chickaloon area near uh, Sutton and Palmer. And those we need to consider because they'll either be burned in Alaska if people want coal-fired power plants here, or in Asia, which, again, is one of the biggest sources to Alaska. Um, very briefly, the, uh, we do need to think about gold mining, because uh, we've been looking at the Donlin mine. It would be the first gold mine in Alaska to thermally process the ore. Um, the new federal regulations that put controls on that kind of processing would allow up to one and a half tons a year uh, released to the air. And we think they'll be processing between 20 and 40 tons a year that will either end up in tailings or captured and stored in some manner and possibly need to be transported out. Those are pretty big numbers, considering that Alaska now releases uh, 71 pounds a year. So it is a local source we really need to think about. Um, as, uh, as Diana mentioned in the, in the introduction, Alaska, despite these potential sources, um, most of, and, and our forest fires and that sort of thing, most of our mercury does come um, from Asia. And it, and it actually arrives in two different ways to Alaska. It arrives coming from the south to the north 
throughout the northern hemisphere, and that's called the grasshopper effect. Um, and then it arrives across the Pacific Ocean from Asia uh, by both latitude and altitude. And, that, and whether it comes over based on latitudes or based on altitudes depends on the form of mercury. Uh, and, and most of that is, again, from um, burning coal, but it's also from burning from forest fires, from burning crops. Um, and, uh, and we also get mercury from, uh, from Siberian fires, and we get mercury from Europe in the wintertime. So some of this is seasonal as to when it's going to arrive and from where. Uh, we can also get some mercury from migratory animals, from salmon and migratory birds. Uh, and that's a pretty minor amount, and they may also take mercury out of the system. So uh, there was a study done that looked at salmon bringing mercury into Bristol Bay, um, about, let's see, 21 kilograms. Uh, it's not, not very much. And, but they also are taking mercury out of the bay. So that's a pretty minor source, but it is, it is a potential source. Um, what we have to think about is when it arrives here, and it begins to precipitate out, either rain, fog, snow, that sort of thing. What is it landing on? Um, there are certain types of landscapes where the mercury will go through the methylation process, which is a bacterially mediated process. And if those bacteria aren't there, there's really very little risk of the mercury. But if they are there, um, then they, they transform the mercury into this toxic methyl mercury. And then we have to look at things like uh, what can be exposed to that. You know, is it, is it uh, absorbed by algae that's then eaten by fish, or does it land on some land plants that are then eaten by land animals? Uh, and, and there's different risks depending on what that landscape is like. So um, one thing that we really need to understand is, is that vegetation tends to be very low in mercury, and animals that only eat vegetation are very low in mercury. So reindeer, caribou, moose, all of those have been found to be traditionally very low in mercury, even though they're large animals. And, and that's because you really need many steps in the food chain to uh, increase the amount of mercury that, that you're being absorbed, um, that you're absorbing into your body. Uh, ptarmigan have also been found to be very low in mercury. Um, the biggest issue that we've all heard about is fish. And again, that depends on the food chain and what their diet is and that sort of thing. So salmon tend to be very low in mer mercury, and other migratory fish would probably be very low. Where you get the higher mercury in fish is, is ones that are located near old mercury mines. Um, and that may be both a natural and a human-based exposure. There is natural mercury in the area, as well as this uh, tailings material that can be has um, high mercury. So they they found Dolly Varden and Grail Arctic Grayling can be high in mercury near some of the old mercury mines, but not in other areas. And that's mostly in the YK, uh, Yukon Kuskokwim area, and Pike as well have been high enough that they've put out some fish advisories in some areas. Um, so again, it depends on diet and location. Um, as far as large fish, what they found is in Alaska, there are some large marine fish that can be high. And that tends to be things like halibut and um, rockfish. And there are marine advisories out for that. Uh, so it's very geographically um, uh, sequestered. Um, so following that same line, there are fish eaters tend to be higher than animals that eat vegetation. So while ptarmigan are low, um, guillemots and seagulls can be very high. Either they're eating fish or they're actually scavenging higher, um, higher terrestrial or higher level um, animals on the food chain. So those, those birds and their eggs may be high in mercury. So it's something to um, kind of, again, it's the, the food chain where the mercury ends up and the kind of um, processes it goes through. And, and to kind of show some of that, the, the impact of diet. So again, you can have very large marine animals, like baleen, like whales. If the whales are plant eaters that strain the phytoplankton um, through baleen, they have much less mercury than whales that eat uh, fish or seals or that sort of thing. They've done studies that show um, that killer whales that eat fish 
have lower mercury than killer whales that eat seals. And seals that eat clams have lower mercury than those that eat fish. So again, it's the, it's the diet and the number of steps in the food chain. The um, highest mercury that has been found in the Arctic has been um, things like pilot whales, uh, beluga whales, again, depending on their diet, uh, ring seals, and uh, polar bears, and some walrus, depending on the location. And then some animals on land, uh, otter and mink, and the birds would be some of your um, fish-eating birds and, and eagles can have high mercury. Um, the fish advisories that are out there in Alaska right now, the only fish advisories in freshwater fish are for pike, and that's in certain sections of the Kuskokwim and the lower Yukon. And they're advising uh, eight meals a month of pike for uh, at-risk women and children. And then the um, marine fish are uh, sable fish, which we also call black cod, uh, some kinds of rockfish, and salmon shark and dogfish. And those range from four to 16 meals per month, depending on the size and, and, um, and, and where they are, I think. So that gives you just kind of a, a, a rough idea where the risk is and the exposure is. And I wanted to mention, too, uh, that there, we do detox. Um, so it's a, it's a balance between how much you're taking in and how much you're eliminating. It takes about two to three months to eliminate um, one batch of mercury that you've received. And they've also found that fish do the same. So they'll, they'll detoxify in about the same period of time. Additionally, if there's high selenium, that can uh, interfere with mercury methylating. And so areas of high selenium, it, it, that affects um, whales and, and uh, people and, and everything else. If there's high selenium in the area, the mercury levels may actually be fairly low. And that's, that's some pretty new research that's coming out. Um, I don't know if I've got any time left. If I do, I can talk about some of the impacts uh, to wildlife. Otherwise, we could just say that the um, wildlife themselves are impacted in the same way that humans are, uh, which is nervous system, uh, reproductive system, um, IQ, all of that kind of thing. E everything that we see in humans, we really also see affecting animals. Ken Kendra, you have about one minute left if you'd like to take it. All right. <laughs> <laughs> I'll, I'll talk about a couple of specific impacts to fish and wildlife, um, you, they actually, if they're high enough in mercury, they can die. They have found mink and otter that have eaten very high levels of mercury and fish actually can die. Um, you can see fewer eggs in some birds. Uh, you can see stillborn uh, pups in some seals. And even fish, they found, may have some immune system issues and may uh, be more susceptible to disease. And I guess I'd end with uh, maybe a bad note. We have this detox, which is a good note. And the bad note is that levels of mercury are actually increasing uh, in the Arctic, unlike levels of lead, which are decreasing. And again, that's because these sources are increasing. Uh, mining and coal and other industry is increasing the global input of mercury. And with that, I'll uh, let the next speaker come on. Thank you, Kendra. Um, next, I'd like to introduce Dr. Alan H. Lockwood. Dr. Lockwood is a professor of neurology at the University at Buffalo. He is a graduate of Cornell University and Cornell University Medical College and was trained in neurology at the University of California, San Francisco. He is board certified in neurology and a member of the American Neurological Association and a fellow of the American Academy of Neurology. Dr. Lockwood is the author of over 200 publications on a range of scientific topics, including environmental toxicants. He has been an active member of Physicians for Social Responsibility, or PSR, for three decades and is currently a member of the board and co-chair of the Environmental and Health Committee. Dr. Lockwood is the principal author of the PSR report titled, Cole's Assault on Human Health, and has a contract with MIT Press to expand this into a book. Welcome, Alan. Would you like to begin? Oh, thank you very much, uh, and uh, good morning, Alaska, from down south here in Buffalo, where it's 30 degrees. Uh, it's a bright, sunny day, and the photovoltaic cells on our roof of our house are probably cranking out to around 4,000 watts of electricity. Um, almost everyone uh, has heard the expression, mad as a hatter, and this is, of course, a reference uh, to 
Lewis Carroll's uh, Alice uh, in Wonderland, where the Mad Hatter was uh, uh, probably the victim of uh, mercury poisoning, which was quite common among among hatters. But the real story of uh, uh, human exposures to mercury that have been well studied began in May of 1956 when several children were admitted to a city hospital in Minamata, Japan. And they had uh, symptoms that included uh, intermittent lapsed into what was referred to as a crazed mental state. They also had epileptic seizures, coma, and high fevers, and they died. Uh, and it turned out that uh, when some of the local physicians began to survey the area, they found that there was about 17 other people living in that uh, little fishing village around Minamata City that had died after identical illnesses. And this triggered a, uh, an epidemiological investigation that ultimately uh, led to the conclusion that these people uh, had died of methylmercury poisoning and the, from mercury that was discharged into Minimata Bay by one of the, uh, the factories uh, in that area. The investigation was complicated by a number of factors. Uh, the residents of Minimata were reluctant to blame this company because it was of central importance in the community. The company failed to reveal the fact that they used large amounts of mercury. Um, and, uh, but finally, in July of 1959, uh, the researchers uh, at one of the universities in Japan concluded that Minamata disease was due to methylmercury poisoning. And when their report was released, it caused a riot. Now, for those of you who may have been in Japan or know about Japanese culture uh, in the late 1950s, a riot is not a typically Japanese form of behavior. The second major incident uh, began in the 1970s when approximately 100,000 tons of wheat and barley seeds that had been treated with a mer mercury-containing fungicide were uh, distributed to various provinces in Iraq. In spite of the fact that these seeds had been dyed red to indicate the fact that they were toxic and been treated with this fungicide, uh, many of these seeds found their way into the food chain uh, after having been milled into flour and used to make bread. Apparently, it was quite easy to wash the dye off, unfortunately. And medical records show that about 90% uh, of those uh, admitted to the hospitals in Iraq uh, in January and February, um, uh, uh, that that was the period of maximum uh, uh, effect. The, uh, the people who were uh, admitted to the hospital there uh, had a latent period of about two to five weeks after eating the affected uh, grains. And they complained of tingling in the toes, feet, and around their mouth and had unsteadiness while they were walking. Visual disturbances uh, occurred along with slurring of the speech and hearing loss. And many of these people went on to die uh, due to collapse of the central nervous system, cardiovascular, uh, and gastrointestinal effects. Uh, at the time, it, in 1973, a total of some 6,500 patients were admitted to hospitals with 459 deaths. Uh, the Minamata experience uh, uh, recorded even more deaths. Uh, there were 1,700 deaths uh, that were attributed to uh, mercury poisoning uh, in, in Minamata, Japan. Now, up until uh, another 10 or 15 years later, those were the major sources of information uh, that were available to indicate uh, what um, health effects uh, one might attribute to various concentrations of mercury. And these were all, of course, uh, relatively high concentrations uh, of mercury due to acute high exposures in these uh, two restricted cohorts of individuals. So there were, uh, as a result of that, uh, there were several studies that were uh, commissioned to investigate uh, the effects, if any, uh, at uh, much lower mercury levels. And the, the best known of these was um, done in the Faroe Islands. 
Now this is a, the, the Faroe Islanders are a Nordic population and there were about 45,000 of those individuals and they were exposed to mercury as a result of eating meat from pilot whales and pilot whales uh, uh, prefer squid and amplify, bioamplify mercury as we heard uh, from the first uh, presentation. So this was an, a monumental study. Uh, the investigators uh, were able to enroll just over a thousand single birth children uh, but, uh, over uh, almost two years beginning in 1986 and they obtained hair samples uh, and blood samples from the mothers uh, at the time of the birth and then they have followed these children uh, for now some of them as long as 15 years and uh, subjected them to periodic testing using very sensitive uh, neuropsychological tests and other tests of nervous system function that have to do with uh, e uh, generating evoked potentials uh, in the brain by low-level electrical stimulation of the fingers or flashing lights in the eyes or hearing clicks in the ears. And the upshot of these studies, uh, particularly in the Faroe Island uh, cohort, revealed evidence for impaired memory, attention, and language function uh, as mercury levels uh, increased uh, in that population. Now, uh, the authors of the report at the time that it was published stressed the fact that these abnormalities were found at mercury exposure levels that were thought to be safe uh, at that time. And as a result of uh, this study and two other studies that were probably from an epidemiological perspective a little less satisfactory in terms of the clarity of what was uh, the, of the conclusions, uh, the Environmental Protection Agency in the United States and the National Research Council uh, evaluated these uh, and, rec and established uh, recommended dose doses uh, that were expected to uh, be safe to eat and by being safe to eat and, uh, means that the likelihood of, pre of affecting nervous system function uh, would be very low. Now that doesn't mean that there wouldn't be any effect, but uh, the effect was uh, was thought to be low. And using these data of of the um, uh, recommended dose uh, and surveys of mercury concentration done in representative samples of uh, women of childbearing age across the United States, uh, other investigators concluded that there were some 600,000 children born each year in the United States who were likely to have uh, blood mercury levels that were in excess of this EPA established target uh, uh, dose of 5.8 uh, micrograms per liter of mercury in cord blood. Now what is the, the likely effect of this uh, uh, going to be? Well probably in you know, with the exception of people who have really very high to and overtly toxic levels of uh, mercury in their blood, uh, you're unlikely to see any effect in a single individual. Now that doesn't mean that this is a good thing. Uh, and if you look at uh, one of the documents that's posted uh, on the website uh, that's titled IQ Distribution Figures 5-1 one, uh, one and 5-2, you can see what happens to uh, the numbers of individuals with a relatively modest decrement in IQ. And these are the kinds of decrements that have been produced by lead and probably a little bit greater than those that might be expected to be seen by uh, mercury. But if you look at this, uh, at this figure, you'll see that when the mean IQ is about 100, uh, just due to the normal uh, distribution of intelligence, you're going to have about 2.3 percent of the population who will be classified legally as being mentally retarded, uh, and another 2.3 who will fall into the gifted range. Now, if you shift that curve to the left and with a decrement in IQ uh, to 95, those five points probably wouldn't be recognized by any of you uh, in during the course of ordinary function. But if you 
look at that uh, from the population uh, perspective, you see that now instead of 2.3% of the population being retarded, you have 3.2% of the population being retarded. And those are people who are going to require extra services uh, and uh, will not have lives that are as productive uh, as they might have been had they not been retarded. And on the other side of the IQ uh, spectrum, you see a similar drop in the number of individuals who would fall into the gifted category, that is to say with uh, IQs in excess of 130. So, And these are the people who will be for better or for worse, developing the next generation of things like Facebook, uh, Twitter, uh, making the kinds of advances that uh, will lead to the production of uh, safe energy uh, and, uh, and uh, sustainable sources of energy that we depend on uh, for the future of uh, society if it's to progress in a normal fashion. Now, all of that has a cost. Uh, the Environmental Protection Agency estimates based on 1990 data, that if you drop one IQ point, you lose about $5,000 a year uh, in earning capacity. And using figures uh, the, of that nature, uh, you can estimate the costs to society from mercury poisoning uh, and small decrements and large numbers of people in IQ uh, that are on the order of uh, several billion dollars uh, per year. So um, this is, uh, in, in an, just to summarize, in individuals, the effects of mercury poisoning are likely to be uh, relatively small if they're detectable at all. Now, that doesn't mean that you should, not, uh, that you should uh, uh, eat, eat mercury-containing fish willy-nilly or eat seals or pilot whales or, or whatever. Uh, but it means that from a societal perspective, uh, measures designed to control the emissions of mercury into the environment uh, have a profound uh, social, economic, and even arguably, I would say, uh, national security uh, implications. If we don't have as many gifted people to lead society forward, our country uh, won't move ahead as we should. And perhaps I'll, I'll stop uh, at that particular point unless there are uh, something that uh, one of the other speakers feels that should be added here. Well, thank you, Alan. Um, and we'll just, you know, we're leaving plenty of time for discussion at the end of the call. So hopefully if things have been, if, if there are things that people would like to see addressed, those will come up at that, at that time. Our final speaker this morning is Sarah Petras. Sarah is Environmental Health Coordinator for Alaska Community Action on Toxics and coordinates ACAT's Beyond Coal Human Health Campaign. Sarah received her master's degree in public health from Portland State University and has been working at ACAT since 2007. Sarah is a graduate of the Environmental Leadership Institute of the League of Conservation Voters Education Fund and a board member of the Alaska Women's Environmental Network. She recently returned from Chiba, Japan, where she attended the second session of the Intergovernmental Negotiating Committee of the UN Environment Program to prepare a global legally binding instrument on mercury. Please begin, Sarah. Thanks, Diana. Good morning, everyone. Today I'd like to talk about actions that Alaska Community Action on Toxics is taking both globally and statewide to reduce mercury emissions and pollution and how you can help. The global implications of mercury pollution call for action on an international level. Negotiations are now underway for a global mercury treaty to minimize and eliminate mercury exposure from anthropogenic sources. ACAT is participating in the negotiations as a member of the International POPs Elimination Network, or IPEN, a global network of more than 700 health and environmental organizations working in over 100 countries. Last month, the second session of the Intergovernmental Negotiating Committee of the United Nations Environment Program was held in Japan to prepare a global and legally binding treaty on mercury. ACAT attended along with a team of approximately 48 non-governmental organizations, or NGOs, from 27 countries, all working collectively to advance treaty provisions that are protective of human health and the environment. Some of IPEN's goals in the Mercury Treaty include the following. To ensure the treaty is comprehensive and legally binding rather than voluntary, 
to ensure the treaty includes appropriate measures to control emissions of mercury to air, water, and land from anthropogenic sources, such as coal combustion and gold mining, and to ensure the treaty obligates parties to develop and implement plans to address mercury-contaminated sites. As an example of the contaminated sites issue, I wanted to share some more information about Minamata, as, as Alan had discussed earlier, the site of Japan's worst industrial pollution case, an infamous mercury contamination incident in which thousands of victims were poisoned from eating mercury-contaminated fish from wastewater discharges of a chemical processing plant. This occurred from the early 1950s until the late 1960s, and many feel that the responsible corporation and the Japanese government still have not adequately responded to the tragedy. Several NGO actions at the INC2 in Japan focused attention on the continuing tragedy of Minamata, the need to finally resolve this and its relevance to the treaty. To show solidarity with Minamata victims, IPEN drafted a statement called Honoring Minamata, which rapidly gained the global support of 72 NGOs from 42 countries in less than a week. This statement is available on the resources page for this call. I believe it's number six on the list. In the negotiations, ACAT also worked with the Inuit Circumpolar Council on a statement to highlight the particular vulnerability of Arctic indigenous peoples to mercury pollution based on the long-range transport of mercury to the Arctic and the high dietary intake of mercury due to its bioaccumulation and biomagnification in northern food webs. This statement is also available on our resources page, um, right beneath the Honoring Minamata statement. In this statement, ACAT and the Inuit Circumpolar Council report that the mercury which has been introduced into the Arctic is not the doing of Arctic indigenous peoples, yet the Arctic environment and people are the recipients of a disproportionate amount of this toxic and persistent element. We urge the delegates to develop an ambitious treaty with strong legally binding provisions on atmospheric emissions and to emphasize sustainable and renewable energy sources rather than focusing on measures to remove mercury and emissions from non-renewable energy sources such as coal. Statewide efforts here in Alaska are addressing sources of mercury pollution from coal development. I'll take a few more minutes to talk about the proposed Chewitna coal mine and the proposed Wishbone Hill and Jonesville coal mines in the Matsu Valley. Um, and Kendra had mentioned these mines, um, proposed mines in Alaska earlier as well. So first I'll talk about the Chewitna mine. Um, the Chewitna watershed on the west side of Cook Inlet is home to Alaska Native and non-Native communities reliant on subsistence, commercial, and sport fishing. Packerim Coal, a Delaware corporation funded by Texas investors, has proposed to develop Alaska's largest coal strip mine in the River Valley, approximately 45 miles west of Anchorage. The proposed strip mine would directly threaten the health of the Chewitna watershed and its residents, as well as the livelihood of local communities. Alaskans statewide would also be adversely affected by development of the Chewitna coal mine due to widespread mercury pollution from exported coal. If developed, 300 million tons of coal over 25 years will be extracted in the first phase of the Chewitna coal mine project. All Chewitna coal is destined for export, with Asian coal-fired power plants being the likely market. As a result, mercury pollution in Alaska associated with burning exported coal in Asia would ex be expected to increase. At present, approximately 20% of the mercury in the state of Alaska is attributed to Asian coal plants and industry. You can get involved in the campaign to protect wild salmon and human health from mercury pollution. The governor, state agencies, and especially your friends and neighbors need to hear from you about issues of concern that directly affect you and the health of your communities. One thing you can do is write a letter to the editor of your local newspaper. We will send out talking points and more information to the participants on this call to help you write letters if you're interested. You can also sign up to host a house party in your community to help raise awareness about the health implications of coal mining and mercury pollution and to take collective action. In the Matsu Valley, about 10 miles northeast of Palmer, Alaska, the Wishbone Hill neighborhood is threatened by a proposed open pit coal strip mine. Home to over 100 families who live within one mile of Usabelli's proposed mine site, this quiet neighborhood will never be the same if a coal strip mine is developed there. Hundreds more people in the region will be adversely affected by toxic coal dust, 
exposure to heavy metals like mercury and other health hazards associated with coal mining and the transportation of coal. Another corporation, Ranger Alaska, wants to renew coal mining at the Jonesville coal mine in Sutton, Alaska. Local residents in the Matsu are concerned about their community's health and safety and are urging the state of Alaska to conduct a full health impact assessment to determine how the community may be impacted. Toxic coal dust blowing from the mining and transportation of coal could cause major adverse health impacts to community residents and subsistence resources. If you think that neighborhoods and watersheds are no place for a coal mine, please speak out. The Stop Polluters page on the Sierra Club's website is a great place to take action in support of strong rulemaking from the EPA on an air toxic standard for power plants. The website is sierraclub.org slash stop polluters. You can also write letters to the editor and sign up to host a house party in your community, and we will email resources to help you in these efforts as well. Your voice is critical and will help keep coal in the ground and protect our health, our salmon, and our communities from mercury pollution. For more information, check out the resources for this call posted on ACAT's website. The toxic trade map illustrates the coal to mercury cycle between Alaska and Asia. The coal, mercury, and health fact sheet that ACAT produced explains in detail the health effects of exposure to mercury from coal development. And at the top of the list of our resources for this call is the Coal Ash in Alaska report, Our Health, Our Right to Know, just published about two weeks ago, also available on ACAT's homepage. Thanks very much for being on the call today, and I'll turn it back over to Diana. Thank you, Sarah. I'd like to thank all of our presenters for taking the time to be with us today and for sharing their expertise, and also for your consideration in leaving um, so much adequate time to address participants' concerns and questions. We have um, nearly 20 minutes, so this should be a lively discussion. We would now like to open the lines for questions and comments, so please wait a moment while we unmute the lines. I wonder if I might uh, just add uh, a brief uh, footnote to the last uh, presentation. Absolutely. Uh, the, the most effective way of controlling mercury emissions from coal-fired power plants is to control overall emissions. And uh, at the present time in the United States, the Environmental Protection Agency is the agency that is charged with uh, developing regulations and enforcing regulations under the Clean Air Act. And the Clean Air Act is under a vicious assault uh, by Republican members of Congress and some Democrats. Uh, so another thing that you can do uh, to support uh, efforts to lower mercury concentration is to act through uh, letters and visits to your uh, senators uh, and members of the House of Representatives, urging them to uh, to strengthen the regulations that are designed to offer us clean air. This is a win for everybody. Uh, EPA estimated in 1990 that the cost to industry to comply with Clean Air Act were somewhere around $500 billion. That sounds like a lot of money, but the improved health care costs for that were on the order of $22 trillion. Uh, so it's a win for everyone to have better air to breathe. So th this is Kendra. I'd like to add something very briefly. Um, th the coal in, in Alaska tends to be actually be very low in mercury. Um, but one thing we need to think about, again, on what Alan said, is with these air regulations, um, Part of our great risk is from the carbon dioxide that is released when the coal is burned, and that actually will be impacting our permafrost and other areas that will increase the landscape that has these methylating bacteria. So it's a little bit of a tangled pathway, but in a way you may be getting more mercury simply by increasing the uh, thawed areas where these bacteria can be active. Thank you, Kendra. I just I need to interject here and just let folks know that if they'd like to ask a question or make a comment, they need to press star six on your telephone to unmute your line, and to, and please state your name and affiliation when you do ask a question. <laughs> Can I ask the lines should now be open. Again, press star six if you'd like to ask a question of any of our speakers, or if you have a general question. This is anyone out there have a question or a comment? Something they'd like to add? Yes. Hello? 
Hello? Yes. Yeah, um, this is Margie Baum. I'm from Alaska Newspapers. Um, just to play devil's advocate here a little bit, um, the mining industry says their business is bringing a lot of jobs, adding to the economy, and that the clean coal process methods are eliminating the hazard. My, my question for all of you or any of you is, is there an economically viable way to actually produce the coal and um, a way to treat it so it can be burned without emitting mercury at its current levels? I, I can answer that, if you like. Sure, Kendra. Yeah. Hi, Margie. Hi. <laughs> um, what the phrase clean coal generally re refers to is removing sulfur and nitrogen from the coal, which has nothing to do with mercury. So we still need to look at mercury uh, capture. And the Healy Clean Coal Plant has no intention of ever capturing mercury that I've seen so far. There, there are ways to, uh, again, this is the clean coal concept refers to storing CO2 in the ground. That's the new, what they mean by clean coal now. They've changed what they mean by it. And that's to sequester the CO2. But again, it has nothing to do with the mercury. So there, there are some ways to capture mercury from power plants, um, but it, that doesn't necessarily have anything to do with clean coal, and I think we need to look at the economics of what that would cost. Now, this is Alan with uh, just a postscript to that. Uh, clean coal is uh, the result of a clever advertising campaign by the very powerful coal industry in the United States. Uh, and there are multi-stages to it. One of those stages is washing coal at the mine site before it gets transported uh, to the power plant. And this has certain economic advantages uh, by getting rid of uh, some of the rock and uh, sulfur that's there. The coal uh, that is shipped is of a higher grade. But all of the bad stuff that comes out of the coal winds up in the slurry that's created by these washing plants. And storing that uh, is, uh, is a, a terrible problem. Uh, and there are numerous sites, and there's a, uh, uh, one of the West Virginia universities uh, maintains a website that identifies leaks from these, the most notorious of which was in Buffalo Creek, West Virginia, where the dam that uh, held back one of these coal slurry waste sites uh, collapsed in the 70s and killed over 100 people and, uh, and decimated uh, an entire city. Uh, the the uh, mercury that gets extracted by uh, from uh, fly ash and other ash that's produced by uh, power plants winds up in that ash, and we uh, create about 120 million tons of uh, coal ash a year in the United States. And uh, what to do with that is a problem. Uh, many of those sites are leaking uh, mercury and other toxic metals and compounds into groundwater. Uh, and of course, the Kingston power plant uh, collapse of the dam uh, just before Christmas uh, two years ago, I believe it was, uh, released billions of gallons of uh, coal ash uh, into waterways and created a tremendous environmental catastrophe. So clean coal has a price. I'd, I'd, act, I'd like to add I'll just a quick postscript to that. In Alaska, you know, the East Coast is really powered by coal, and so they have these huge slurry ponds and this big problem with coal combustion waste. In Alaska, so far, our coal fire power plants are quite small, and I, I suspect that um, we have very little issue at this point. But if they do develop a lot of mining and they want to, uh, more coal fire power plants as our natural gas supplies decrease, that is something that we're going to have to worry about. Hello. Hello. Yes, go ahead. Hi. Um, whew, I'm terrified by what I'm hearing and what I'm learning. My name is Teresa DeLima, and my parents live 600 feet from the power plant on First Avenue. My mother has rheumatoid arthritis, Alzheimer's, gastrointestinal disorders, and extremely severe osteoporosis. My father 
has begun to shake. The doctors have not told him that it's Parkinson's, but it's Parkinson's like. He has, there are a host of problems here. And I see those coal trucks every day, several times a day, transporting it and dumping it. And I am terrified. I have put a filter into my parents' house. I'm going to have it tested for heavy metals. But I have learned so much in the last week, and I am terrified. We moved my mother in from Manly Hot Springs for her help. <laughs> and it hasn't made it any better and uh, I apologize for my emotions here I have a very good friend who is in the end stages of sarcoidosis and I watched the dumping of coal ash not a thousand yards probably from where his shop and his workplace are. And I am terrified. Something has to be done. And I'm going to be a part of the big thing that gets done here. And I'm going let it, to let it go back to everybody else now. Uh, this is Dr. Lacletrice. I'm really terribly sorry to hear about the health problems of your parents. Uh, I don't know what to do. If well, I could get them out of that house immediately, I would. And that's what I'm trying to do right now. Because I, honest to God, I followed that friggin' truck yesterday. And my chest is heavy from it. I know. I'm sorry, go ahead. And, Teresa, you live, in, you live in Fairbanks, correct? You're talking yes. about... Okay, yes. just wanted to make sure everyone knows um, where you're talking about. Yes. We, okay. My parents, the house is at 1319 First Avenue, and I believe the coal power plant is at 1206. Anyway, I've, 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 I've got a lot of experience with this. My parent, my grandparents' home... Uh, I spent a lot of time there as a kid, and uh, I definitely am interested in helping this thing along. You've, you've taken a few of the first important steps to do that by being on the call today and becoming yeah. active. Uh, so uh, I wish you and your your parents nothing but the best of luck, and and uh, you know hang in there and do what you can to. Uh, force a remediation of the problems. Yeah, I would also suggest um, talking to the Department of Health and Human Services. They do have a free hair mercury testing program that's okay. normally only for uh, women of childbearing age. But if you tell them your situation, I, I think they would go ahead and test that for you. And that would tell you a lot about whether it's mercury or potentially it could be some other kind of, of metals and, and certainly just the dust itself can have impacts on um, right. whether metals are or not. And so that would give you, I think, a little bit of clarity whether it's mercury or not. Okay. Thank you. And Sarah, did you want to add anything um, about what folks in the Fairbanks area can do who are concerned about that disposal of the coal combustion waste? Well, we do have some information um, from a study that we conducted in Fairbanks last summer um, sampling this coal ash material from sources of um, coal ash waste and uh, also disposal sites. Um, the EPA is now considering regulations on how to, to move forward with this handling of this material and um, the, public, the public comment period has ended for that. Um, but I think it's still important to speak up about your concerns about this and talk to your neighbors um, 
and, and we can help with writing letters to the editor and um, other actions that people can take. Thank you, sir. The, the EPA uh, coal combustion waste public hearings were uh, heavily attended, and there were many, many people uh, who went and spoke out. Uh, so the EPA has gotten an earful uh, from people who live too close to these places and from environmental organizations and scientists. Uh, if this follows the typical EPA rulemaking process, they will come forth with a proposed rule uh, or, uh, and then there will be an additional opportunity for public comment and I would urge you to take advantage of that opportunity. Dr. Lockwood, yes. can we take one more question? Maybe? Sure. We have about four more minutes, so please go yeah. ahead. Yeah, this is Dr. Roseanne on Whidbey Island. And I'm wondering, I have two questions for you. The way you describe the safe limits being set, for instance, looking at the diet and the Faroe Island, I'm wondering if that is a little multi, you know, single dimensional and we need a broader look at the impact one because mercury interacts in many different ways in different people, where there is, for instance, diet differences. Malnutrition, I think, increases one's susceptibility to mercury. And then does mercury have more impact than just, say, reducing intelligence? Might other people develop serious health problems because the immune system is malfunctioning and it interacts with other heavy metals, as you mentioned, with selenium present or not, et cetera. So I'm just wondering if that's quite an accurate uh, setting of levels or we need to be much more cautious because of these other factors. And then secondly, could you quickly address the impact of the elemental mercury in mercury filling? Uh, sure. Um, I hope I didn't say that, the, that any level of mercury in the blood was safe. Uh, what, what I think I said was that EPA established a target uh, for mercury, as with uh, all of the environmental toxicants, uh, there is no demonstrably safe level f for uh, for mercury or uh, oxides of sulfur or nitrogen or carbon monoxide or ozone or any of those uh, environmental pollutants uh, that uh, are related to burning coal. Uh, so any mercury in your body is, uh, is bad. Um, the second point is that, of course, this is all very complicated. And uh, by avoiding uh, fish that might be uh, contaminated with mercury, you also lose the beneficial effects of eating fish, particularly the omega-3 fatty acids that are essential for normal brain development. Uh, so the best choice would be to uh, concentrate on fish that have demonstrably been shown to be low in mercury, and there are Alaska fish advisories that are posted on, if you Google Alaska fish advisories, you'll go to the, uh, the website and you'll see uh, species specific information for, uh, for uh, Alaskans. And then the second one on the, amalg the elemental uh, mercury and amalgam fillings, does that relate to this question at all? Um, I, I, there, there are the there is no recommendation to have uh, dental amalgams removed uh, to uh, reduce uh, uh, mercury exposure. So when that happens, it, it actually uh, produces, you know, when you grind up the, the amalgams with the dental drill, uh, you can't uh, help but swallow some of that. So you'll get a transient increase uh, in the exposure. Um, so it's not, it's not recommended uh, to uh, remove dental amalgams. Uh, there are very few dentists now uh, that that use uh, silver mercury amalgams for restorations. Uh, almost all of them use a ceramic or a plastic material now. Ironically, though, some of the, the it is a measurable source of mercury contamination in the environment for um, uh, individuals uh, uh, who choose cremation. Thank you, Dr. Lockwood. I think we are out of time. Um, so thank you, everyone, for participating this morning. This call will be posted on our website this week. The recording will be posted. And thank you again for joining us today. If you have additional questions or comments, 
please feel free to con contact us at 907-222-7714 or by email. You can email sarah at akaction.org and that's S-A-R-A-H at akaction.org. Again, um, we have a new website with all of the audio recordings from the past several years of our CHA calls and I really encourage you to visit that and, and listen to any call that you've missed. We've covered a range of topics, um, all very important and I hope that you'll check that out. Thank you once again to all of our speakers and all of our participants and we look forward to our next call in March. The topic will be announced on our website within the next week or two. Thanks so much and have a wonderful day. Thank you very much. Thank, Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye. Bye.